We start with a point. Hi, welcome back. My name is Rob Bryanton, and this is the Imagine the Tenth Dimension video blog. Uh, today's entry is called Alien Mathematics, and it's uh, very strongly connected to an article that was uh, written by Martin Rees and uh, published in New Scientist magazine. Uh, uh, we're uh, looking at an illustration that comes from that article, and uh, I'm going to start out reading from uh, something that was actually a sidebar on the article called The Enigma of Infinity. Infinity is an ancient mystery, and unendingness is hard to conceive. As far back as 350 BC, Greek philosophers speculated about what would happen if you could throw a spear from the edge of space, should such a place exist. It seems absurd that there should be no beyond where it can go. Space may curve up on itself, and so be finite but unbounded, but equally it could go on forever. Infinity is qualitatively different from even the largest number. Finite numbers, however large, obey the laws of arithmetic. You can add, multiply, and divide them, and put different numbers unambiguously in order of size. But an infinity is the same as a part of itself, and even when it is multiplied by another number, even another infinity, it is in a well-defined sense just the same. A metaphor for this is known as Hilbert's Hotel. Suppose a hotel is full, and each guest wants to bring a colleague who would need another room. This would be a nightmare for the management, who could not double the size of the hotel instantly. In an infinite hotel, though, there's no problem. The guest from room 1 goes into room 2, the guest in room 2 into room 4, and so on. All the odd-numbered rooms are then free for new guests. And again, that comes from an article uh, that uh, we're talking about today that was published in New Scientist magazine. Uh, the illustration that's behind me here had a little caption under it too. It says, an alien's description of the cosmos might teach us a thing or two about the nature of reality. And the image comes from Wolcott Henry, National Geographic Getty. Last entry in the Flexi Laws of Physics, we talked about the amazing possibility that the basic locked-in physical laws of our universe may have been retroactively adjusted during the initial stages of creation. Back in July 2006, over at the 10th Dimension Forum, Here's one of the discussions we got into within its very first month. Our universe exists within space-time, and space is not the same as space-time. If we have a 3D space without time, then we can define a set of coordinates within that space with values for x, y, and z. But without the direction of either time or anti-time, these coordinates can't be changed. They're locked in. These coordinates could then all be referenced within a Planck scale frame of space-time, which we can then think of as a point within the fourth dimension. If we move to some other different 4D point, then all three values for x, y, and z can be changed. Taking that idea to the seventh dimension, we can see that if our universe is locked in by a single 7D point, then there must be an unchanging set of values for u, v, w, x, y, and z, which would be six arbitrary letters assigned to the six degrees of freedom afforded by the six spatial dimensions below. Which leads to the question that was discussed at the 10th Dimension Forum, are there six aspects of our universe that remain unchanged throughout its existence? At the time, I suggested to Forum regular Daniel McQueen that there seemed to be an interesting tie-in there with astrophysicist and cosmologist Martin Rees, whose book Just Six Numbers, The Deep Forces That Shape the Universe, I had read a couple of years before. Do those six numbers really connect to the first six dimensions as I visualize them? Is it possible to consider a wave function of all possible outcomes for our universe and have them all be constrained by six values, six unchanging positions within six-dimensional space? That's a tricky possibility to wrap your head around. On the other hand, the idea from string theory that our universe is locked in at the seventh dimension by a D7 brain does seem to be a more likely connection. Earlier this year, Sir Martin Rees published an article in New Scientist called Mathematics, the Only True Universal Language. Let's look at the opening paragraphs of this article. If we ever establish contact with intelligent aliens living on a planet around a distant star, we would expect some problems communicating with them. As we are many light years away, 
our signals would take many years to reach them, so there would be no scope for snappy repartee. There could be an IQ gap, and the aliens might be built from quite different chemistry. Yet there would be much common ground too. They would be made of similar atoms to us. They could trace their origins back to the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, and they would share with us the universe's future. However, the surest common culture would be mathematics. Mathematics has been the language of science for thousands of years, and it is remarkably successful. In a famous essay, the great physicist Eugene Wigner wrote about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Most of us resonate with the perplexity expressed by Wigner, and also with Einstein's dictum that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. We marvel at the fact that the universe is not anarchic, that atoms obey the same laws in distant galaxies as in the lab. The aliens would, like us, be astonished by the patterns in our shared cosmos and by the effectiveness of mathematics in describing those patterns. Rees then takes us through an exploration of the different mathematical breakthroughs which occurred in the 20th century, which moves us on to superstrings as the dominant cosmological theory of our time. He mentions that despite the commercial success in the last few years of popular books, claiming that string theory is not even wrong, many of the brightest minds of our day continue to explore this promising field. Martin Rees writes, String theory involves scales a billion billion times smaller than any we can directly probe. At the other extreme, our cosmological theories suggest that the universe is vastly more extensive than the patch we can observe with our telescopes. It may even be infinite. The domain that astronomers call the universe, the space, extending more than 10 billion light years around us and containing billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars, billions of planets, and maybe billions of biospheres, could be an infinitesimal part of the totality. There is a definite horizon to direct observations, a spherical shell around us, such that no light from beyond it has had time to reach us since the Big Bang. However, there is nothing physical about this horizon. If you were in the middle of an ocean, it is conceivable that the water ends just beyond your horizon, except that we know it doesn't. Likewise, there are reasons to suspect that our universe, the aftermath of our Big Bang, extends hugely further than we can see. Regular readers of my blog will recognize that Martin Rees is using a similar visualization to the one I used in my blog entry, The Holographic Universe. Visualizing that space-time, rather than space, has a very slight curvature to it, allows us to see how we could be like someone floating out in the middle of an ocean, perceiving a universe of a certain size and age, but the universe itself could be much larger than what we're able to see. Imagining, then, that an alien race billions of light-years away would also find themselves to be right at the very center of an equally spherical universe of a similar age ties to the surprising idea we explored in Where Are You? No matter who you are or where you are in the universe, you're right at the center. Extending this idea into a set of parallel universes for our own universe and a multiverse landscape for all other possible universes becomes even more boggling. Martin Rees writes, The multiverse confronts us with infinities, multiplied by other infinities, perhaps repeatedly. To bring sense to these concepts, we must deploy the mathematics of transfinite numbers which date back to Cantor in the 19th century. He showed that there was a rigorous way to discuss infinity and that in a well-defined sense, there are infinities of different sizes. Without these exotic concepts, cosmologists will not be able to firm up the concept of the multiverse theory and decide, without paradoxes or ambiguities, what is probable and what is improbable within it. The final section of Sir Martin's article gets into ideas that seem to relate to our discussions from the past month, as we've looked at computers and consciousness, logic versus intuition, and connecting it all together. He concludes, Maybe in the far future, though, post-human intelligence will develop hypercomputers with the processing power to simulate living things, even entire worlds. Perhaps advanced beings could even simulate a universe that goes far beyond mere patterns on a checkerboard and the best movie special effects. Their simulated universe could be as complex as the one we perceive ourselves to be in. This raises a disconcerting thought. Perhaps that is what our universe really is. 
it is fascinating to speculate whether hyper-intelligent aliens already exist in some remote part of our cosmos. If so, would their brains package reality in a mathematical language that would be comprehensible to us or our descendants? Martin Rees is Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics and Master of Trinity College at the University of Cambridge. He was appointed Astronomer Royal in 1995 and is President of the Royal Society. This article is based upon contributions to a discussion by a panel that included mathematician Michael Atia and Alain Kahn about the relationship between mathematics and science. It's interesting to think about how the basic physical laws of our universe might be what we could use as a starting point in learning to communicate with an alien species from far, far away. In the Biocentric Universe and the Biocentric Universe Part 2, we've talked about the amazing new theories using retrocausality. It has now been proven that observations made now can affect certain indeterminate conditions back then. If this is the case, is it possible that the amazing amount of biodiversity that we see around our planet might also be giving us more glimpses into what alien life is going to look like than we realize? In my book and this blog, I've talked about how there could be other completely different ways of expressing matter and energy that would still rightly be called life, but perhaps those other formulations exist only within other parts of the multiverse landscape. Perhaps when we do finally find life elsewhere in the universe, the fine-tuning of our universe's conditions will have created forms that only seem as alien as the strange assortment of creatures we can find on our own planet. And if biocentrism is true, then it might be that the alien race we eventually encounter could have come from a first spark of life that appeared billions of years before life started on Earth, and that it was actually that alien life form that performed this reverse fine-tuning of our universe's basic physical constants to allow all life as we know it to appear within our universe. <laughs> Fascinating stuff to think about. Next blog entry is going to be called What's South of the South Pole? My name's Rob Bryanson. Enjoy the journey.